1 Samuel 4, verse 11, the Bible says this, And the ark of God was taken, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were slain. And there ran a man of Benjamin out of the army and came to Shiloh the same day with his clothes rent and with earth upon his head. And when he came, lo, Eli sat upon a seat by the wayside watching, for his heart trembled for the ark of God. And when the man came into the city and told it, the city cried out. And when Eli heard the noise of the crying, he said, What meaneth the noise of this tumult? And the man came in hastily and told Eli. Now Eli was ninety-eight years old, and his eyes were dim that he could not see. And the man said unto Eli, I am he that came out of the army, and I fled today out of the army. And he said, What is there done, my son? And the messenger answered and said, Israel is fled before the Philistines, and there hath been also a great slaughter among the people. And thy two sons also, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of God is taken. And it came to pass, when he made mention of the ark of God, that he fell from off the seat backward by the side of the gate, and his neck brake, and he died. For he was an old man and heavy, and he had judged Israel forty years. And his daughter-in-law, Phineas' wife, was with child near to be delivered. And when she heard the tidings that the ark of God was taken, and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed herself and travailed, for her pains came upon her. And about the time of her death, the women that stood by her said unto her, Fear not, for thou hast born a son. But she answered not, neither did she regard it. And she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory of is, I'm sorry, the glory is departed from Israel, because the ark of God was taken, and because of her father-in-law and her husband. And she said, The glory is departed from Israel, for the ark of God is taken. Let's pray and we'll get going tonight. Lord, we love you. Thank you again for the time to be here. Lord, thank you for each person who's made an effort to come out to your house tonight. Lord, I pray that you would bless them for that. pray that you'll bless the word as it goes forth. Lord, as we heard this morning, that it would be received as it is in truth, the word of God. And that it would be effectual in our lives. And Lord, help us to serve you better, to love you more. Lord, pray that souls would be saved. And Lord, if anyone here tonight is not saved and doesn't know you as their personal Lord and Savior, I pray tonight would be their hour of salvation. Lord, I pray tonight they would come to know you as their personal Savior before it's eternally too late. Lord, we thank you again for your word and for the freedom that we have to preach it and study it and read it and live it. I ask you to help us to do that in the days to come. In Jesus' name, amen. And the title of tonight's message is Things Greatly Feared. Things Greatly Feared. And as we read this account, there's a synopsis of what happened. Israel was defeated. As we looked at last week, they went and they got the Ark of God and they thought that was going to help them in that battle, but... The ark of God has no power without the God of the ark. And so they went and got the thing that they thought was going to help them, and the thing had no power whatsoever. And they were defeated, and the ark of God was taken, as we saw here in this passage. And Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, the wicked sons of Eli, were killed. And we know that that was a fulfillment of prophecy, and we'll look at it here in just a little bit. But the news comes to Shiloh about that defeat in verse 12. And there's some things that happen, and really we want to continue on that thought of they wanted the ark of God and not the God of the ark. Because there were some things that happened and some news that was given to certain people here that when they heard that news, literally, it ended their life. They were so taken and they were so so fearful of one thing happening, and when that one thing happened, that was the end of them. And so let's get into the message. We'll look at that. Verse 13 and 14, the Bible says this, that Eli trembled. His heart trembled. The entire city cries out. There's a noise of tumult. Tumultuous noise. If you've ever um, have a mob scene, if you will. Just absolute chaos. And then verse 18 there, the Bible says that Eli died. In verse 19 through 22, we have the account of Phineas's wife getting, giving birth, but she also passes away. What was it that caused all of this chaos? What was it that caused the death of these people? That's what we're going to look at tonight. There, if you will, in verse 17. The Bible says, And the messenger answered and said, Israel has fled before the Philistines. There hath been also a great slaughter among the people, and thy two sons, also Hophni and Phineas. Are dead. So this young man leaves the battle and he comes into the city of Shiloh and he's, he's announcing this and Eli is sitting on a seat, by the way. 
and his eyes are dim and, and maybe he's hard of hearing and he hears all the, the commotion going on. He says, what happened? And the young man runs in and he tells him, there's been a great slaughter. Israel, many people in Israel are dead. And, and Eli, your two sons are dead. Now, hold your place. I told you that was a fulfillment of prophecy. Look back at chapter 2 quickly. Chapter 2, verse 27. <clears throat> chapter two twenty seven. the Bible says this, And there came a man of God unto Eli. This is after the, the wickedness of Eli, or of Hophni and Phinehas is made known. And said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Did I plainly appear unto the house of thy father when they were in Egypt and Pharaoh's house? And did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer upon mine altar, to burn incense, to wear the ephod before me? And did I give unto the house of thy father all the offerings made by fire of the children of Israel? Wherefore kick ye at my sacrifice? And at mine offering. And we know that Hophni and Phinehas, they had corrupted the offering of God. They would made men to abhor it. They had caused men to hate the holy thing that was supposed to be done in Israel. Wherefore, kick ye at my sacrifice and at mine offering, which I have commanded in mine habitation, and honorest thy sons above me, to make yourselves fat with the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel, my people. Remember what the Bible said about Eli over there? It said he was a heavy guy. You know how he got heavy? He was abusing the offering of God. He was taking things that didn't belong to him, and his sons were doing the same thing. Verse 30, Wherefore saith the Lord of Israel, I said indeed that thy house and the house of thy father should walk before me forever, but now the Lord saith, Be it far from me. For them that honor me I will honor, and them that and they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days come that I will cut off thine arm and the arm of thy father's house, that there shall not be an old man in thine house. And thou shalt see an enemy in my habitation, and all the wealth of, Israel, of God shall give Israel. And there shall not be an old man in thine house forever. Verse 33. And the man of thine whom I shall not cut off from mine altar shall be to consume thine eyes and to grieve thine heart. And all the increase of thine house shall die in the flower of their age. Now verse 34. Here's the prophecy. And this shall be a sign unto thee that shall come upon thy two sons on Hophni and Phinehas. In one day they shall die, both of them. That's a fulfillment in chapter 4, verse 11. Hophni and Phinehas. Both die in one day. It's God's prophecy fulfilled. God's prophecy will always be fulfilled. His word will always come through and carry through. And so we see that Israel's fled as this young man comes in and tells Eli, Israel's fled has been a great slaughter and your sons are dead. But you know, that's not what knocked Eli off the seat. You know, you would think a man who had two sons when he hears of, and remember there were 34,000 people killed in that battle. 34,000. And all Israel, all the army is scattered. And his two own sons, his own flesh and blood, are dead. And yet that's not what knocks him off his seat. Say, what knocks him off his seat? Keep reading. Verse 17, the Bible says, we'll start reading at the head of the verse. The messenger answered and said, Israel fled before the Philistines. There has been also a great slaughter among the people. Thy two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of God is taken. Verse 18. And it came to pass when he made mention, not of his sons, not of the 34,000 dead, not of the army of Israel scattered, when he made mention of the ark of God, that he fell from off the seat backward by the side of the gate and his neck break, and he died, for he was an old man and heavy. What was it that caused Eli and the thing that he feared greatly? Because remember, verse 13 said his heart was trembling. As the news came in, his heart was trembling, again, not about the men that died, not about his sons. He was worried about the ark. He was worried about the thing, the religious thing that they had. And they had taken it in the battle, and he was worried about that. And as the young man comes in and lays all the tragedy before him and says, and the ark was taken, and he <gasps> falls off his seat and breaks his neck. In other words, he, he was so afraid what was going to happen to the ark, that as soon as he heard the worst news that he feared, it overtook him, and I guess we can say he passed out and fell backward and broke his neck. Eli's heart trembled for the ark. He wasn't trembling for fear of Israel's defeat or the loss of his sons, but for the loss of the ark. He was trembling over the loss of a thing. You understand how crazy that is? He was worried about a thing, not a person. Worried about a thing. The thing that Eli greatly feared. 
had come upon him and it cost him his life. It caused him to die. So I wonder tonight as we sit here in, <clears throat> in church on a Sunday night and we have our Bibles before us and we've had a good day in the Lord, I wonder, are we more concerned about religious things than we are about people? Are we more concerned about religious rites and religious rituals than we are about people? Because what happened here was the ark of God was taken and God wasn't within a million miles of that ark. His presence wasn't even close. Although it resembled God's presence, He wasn't with it. And they thought that this thing, this religious thing, was going to deliver them out of the hand of their enemy. And it didn't. And, they, and Eli was so worried, not about people, but about this religious thing, that when he heard that it had been taken in battle, it ended his life. He was so wrapped up in the religion of it that he forgot about the people. May we never be that way at Spring City Baptist Church. May we never be that way. I think, uh, I think God did this on purpose. I really do. I think He took the ark of God away from them, just like He took the golden calf, just like He took all the other idols that they would worship through the years. Took it away from them because they were worshiping the ark of God instead of the God of the ark. They were worshiping the thing. They were not worshiping the person. But here we see that the thing that Eli greatly feared came upon him. And it came to pass. So keep that, that thought in mind. We'll keep reading there. Look at verse 19. 1 Samuel 4, verse 19. The Bible says this, And his daughter-in-law, Phineas' wife, was with child, near to be delivered. And when she heard the tidings that the ark of God was taken and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed herself and travail for her pains came upon her. So here in verse 19, we see that his wife, Phineas' wife, hears the news. The ark is taken. Eli is dead. Your husband is dead. And she's great with child and she bows over and the pain and travail of labor immediately hits her. And she delivers this child, but verse 20 goes on to tell us a little bit more. It says, about the time of her death, it caused her to die. It was so painful and it was such a shock to her, it caused death upon her. And so we see that not only did she go into labor, but it brought about her death. The thing that she had greatly feared came upon her. But you understand it wasn't the death of Eli. It wasn't the death of her own husband. I want you to listen carefully because I'm not trying to be insensitive when I say this. We're talking about things greatly feared and if they come upon us, what kind of effect will that have upon our life? I, I wonder if we took a poll here tonight and I asked each one of you, what is the one thing that you fear the most happening in this life? Some of us new parents, we may say, well, if my, my child dies, that, that would be a legitimate fear. Or some of you, your spouses, if, if my spouse passed away, that would be the thing that I fear the most. Some of us, it may be if I lost my house. I don't know what it would be. I, I know we asked these kids, and, and Dan and Andrew could, could tell you, I asked these kids, I said, suppose your house burns down tonight. But now you and your family, you all get out safe. It's just you're losing things. What's the thing that you would miss the most? And some of them said, well, the house or my Xbox 360 or my iPhone, you know, whatever it was. They were just, well, what was the point of that? I wanted them to understand if their happiness was wrapped up in a thing, it wasn't true happiness. Because things get old. Things pass away. Things get destroyed. Happiness is in a person. That's the person, Lord Jesus Christ. That's where true happiness lies. And so here, we see the things that she greatly feared. It wasn't the loss of Eli. It wasn't the loss of her own husband. But what was it? Look down there in verse 21. The Bible says this, And she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory of the Lord... I'm sorry, the glory is departed from Israel, because the ark of God was taken, and because her father-in-law and her husband... Verse 22, and she said, the glory is departed from Israel, for the ark of God is taken. In those two verses, twice, she tells you where her heart is. She said, the ark of God was taken. The glory is departed from Israel. The thing that she trembled and feared the most was just like Eli, that ark being taken. Even though the news of Eli's death and Phineas' death compounded the situation, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. 
She said twice in those two verses, the glory of the Lord has departed for the ark of God is taken. She had her happiness and her hope wrapped up in a thing as well. And it caused her death, ultimately. The glory is departed because the ark is taken. She seemingly cared more for the ark than for her own newborn son, her husband, or for Eli. And again, I think God took away their little g-god because they forgot the true and living God. Because they sat there and they said, there's a thing that we greatly fear, and if it comes upon us, we're done. And tonight, I want, I want us as a church to be very careful about this. When tragedy comes, don't let that be the end of our service for the Lord Jesus Christ. When hardships come in life, don't let that be the end of service for the Lord Jesus Christ. And certainly, don't let that be the end of your literal life. Suicide is not the answer for Christians. It ought never be named among us. And as I told you, I want you to, to listen carefully to this because you know, many times the death of a loved one or, or the death of someone that we, we love dearly will, will cause us to veer off course. And I understand there's a time for weeping, there's a time for mourning. I'm not saying that that's wrong. But that shouldn't be a permanent departure. That shouldn't be a permanent departure from serving God. Even though there's need, there needs to be a time of mourning, there's also, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 3, a time to laugh and a time to dance. And don't let that steer us off course. So I'm wondering tonight, what things do we greatly fear? What things do you greatly fear? What do I greatly fear? I don't think God would do this out of spite. But I think you and I need to seriously search our heart about this. Because what if that thing we greatly feared came to pass? What would we do? What would be our reaction? You say, what's going on? I don't know what's going on. I just know that for by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for all have sinned. Trouble in this life comes because of sin. And if God allows it to happen in our life, the reaction that we have is very, very important. And as Eli and Phineas' wife here, they had the thing that they greatly feared happen to them. And it ended their life. That was the end of them. Turn over to Job chapter 3. Try to tie all this together. Job chapter 3. Job was a man who was a righteous man, God said. He said he was a perfect man. He said he eschewed evil. He obviously lived his life in fear of the Lord and in respect and reverence of the Lord. And he lived his life in such a way that it caught the devil's attention. And so Satan brings him up before God one day and he says, Hast thou considered my servant Job? And Satan said, Yeah, he only loves you because you've blessed him. God said, Okay, touch all of his physical possessions, take him away, spare his life. And so Satan goes, takes everything away in one day. Satan comes back and he says, and the Lord says, I'll consider my servant Job. And he said, he only loves you because you've got good health. Because you've given him good health. And the Lord said, okay, take his health, but spare his life. And so Satan smites Job, takes away his health. And yet through all that, Job never sinned or charged God foolishly. Now that story, I give you the background for this reason. Chapter 3 of Job, verse 24 for my sighing cometh before I eat, and my roarings are poured out like the waters. Look what he said. For the thing which I greatly feared is come upon me. And that which I was afraid of is come unto me. The thing that he greatly feared had come upon him. He was a righteous man. He was serving God. He was busy doing right. And the thing that he greatly feared came upon him. You say, what was it? Well, let's see what it was not. Turn back to chapter 1. It was not his possessions. He didn't fear losing his possessions. Chapter 1, verse 13. And there was a day when the sons of his and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. There came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them. And the Sabians fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking... There came also another and said, The fire of God has fallen from heaven, and hath burned up the sheep and the servants, and consumed them, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. 
While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away, yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. I meant to stop at verse 17. He wasn't scared about losing his possessions, and I'll tell you that. I'll show you why in a minute. Verse 18, he, wasn't, he didn't greatly fear losing his family. Verse 18 says that they were, the sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. Verse 19, and behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. He loses all of his possessions, and he loses all of his sons and daughters in one day. Can you imagine the richness of Job and ten children gone in a day? That wasn't the thing he greatly feared. Say, so how do you know? Verse 20. Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and did what? And worshipped. You say, do you think Job missed them? Was it hard on Job? I'm sure it was. But that wasn't the thing that he greatly feared. Because all that happened and he was able still to worship God. 21, and he said, Naked came out of my mother's womb and naked shall I return thither. And the Lord gave, the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all of this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. So it wasn't in the loss of possessions, it wasn't in the loss of family that Job greatly feared. Let's keep reading verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 7. So went Satan forth from the, pe- from the presence of the Lord... And smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. And he took him a pot shirt to scrape himself with all, and he sat down among the ashes. The thing that Job greatly feared wasn't the loss of his health. Verse 9. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. The thing that Job greatly feared was not the loss of his wife. So how do you know? Verse 10. But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? In all of this did not Job sin with his lips. You say, well, pastor, what was the one thing that Job greatly feared that had come upon him, even though all those negative things, all those bad things and tragedies happened? What was the one thing that he greatly feared? Turn to chapter 10. And really, this is laced throughout the entire book of Job and his responses to his friends, but it's very apparent right here. Chapter 10, verse 1. The Bible says, My soul is weary of my life. I will leave my complaint upon myself. I will speak in the bitterness of my soul. He's bitter about this. I will say unto God, Do not condemn me, but... Show me wherefore thou contendest with me. What was the one thing Job greatly feared? He feared God being against him. He feared God breaking fellowship with him. And throughout the whole book of Job, you'll hear him ask this question, God, just tell me why you're doing this. That's all he wanted to know. God, why are you doing this? Why am I dealing with this? I'm a righteous man. You said I was a good man. You said I shoot evil. I'm trying to serve you. Why is all this coming upon me? You know what God said? And that ate at Job. That was the thing that he greatly feared. Was God not talking to him. And you get there at the end of the book. And when God starts talking, he's asking Job all these questions. And Job said, I'm vile. I'm wicked. I'm sorry. And that was his thing that he greatly feared. Eli and Phineas' wife, the thing that they greatly feared was the loss of a physical possession. And what they did not understand is they had lost the fellowship with God Almighty because they were worshiping the ark of the God and not the God of the ark. I don't know what's going on in your life tonight. I really don't. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're at church. I'm glad every one of us are, are here and say we love the Lord. I'll say this. Whatever the thing is that you greatly fear, If God allows that to come upon you, don't you curse God. Don't you quit on God. Don't you say, don't you point your finger at him and say, God, you're unrighteous for letting that happen to me. Don't you do that. Say, you don't know what's going on in my life. I don't know what's going on in your life. I don't know why God put this thought on my heart tonight. But he did. 
And I don't know what we may face in the next month, year, 10 years, 100 years. I have no idea. But I'll say this. Whatever comes in our life in a negative fashion, the very last thing we should do is break that fellowship with God, have bitterness in our heart, hardness in our heart, because God's the only one that can handle it. He's the only one that can help us. And may we not look at him and say, God, how dare you? No, how dare we say that? May we always have a tender heart toward him. And Job, you know, I, I really think in all that right there, if Job had just in a, in a clear heart towards God laid his face on the ground and just said, Lord, what's going on? I think God might have showed him. But you know what he did? He tried to justify himself with those friends every single time. And pride welled up in his heart. And God just let it go. May we not lose the relationship with God over the thing of a religion. Let's pray.